this is the intro session to our assessments data comparisons across statistical software, um, which is in follow up to um, choosing a statistical language for career development, um, which was the previous hours for um, people who weren't here for the previous hour. Uh, we'll just do like a quick less than one minute introduction, then we'll jump into some coding demonstrations. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so my name is Case. I am a second year nutritional epidemiology and data science student. Um, I use R almost exclusively, so I have a strong bias towards that, but I'm also just interested in learning new programming softwares and also um, trying to teach new programming softwares. So um, thank you guys for showing up to this uh, workshop. And uh, I'll hand it off to Emily if you want to do a quick intro. Absolutely. So good evening or you know, good, good time of day from where you may be watching this asynchronously. Uh, my name is Emily Sanchez and I just can't not ignore that it's National Nutrition Month. So happy March 1st, National Nutrition Month. So excited you guys are kicking off this month uh, with us this evening. Um, I'm a first year PhD student in the nutritional, um, nutritional Epidemiology and Data Science program here at Tufts. And just um, where my background and where I'm coming from, I'm a registered dietitian and I used SPSS as part of my master's years ago. And I'd say since then, I haven't had that much experience with other coding softwares until my time at Tufts, which has been wonderful. Um, but I started with SAS and I've um, dived more and more into R and my preference goes back and forth quite frequently. Um, but I'm just excited to share what I've learned and hopefully can um, maybe uh, tackle. I know I had anxiety when I started coding and just make it approachable um, and know that it's a learning process. So I'm excited just to share what I've learned with you all and, and go from there. Kyle? Hi, everyone. Finding that unmute button is always hard for me. Um, I'm Kyle Monahan. Great to meet you. Uh, senior data science specialist in TTS. Um, I look forward to to uh, working with you all. Um, I just want to echo uh, Emily's great sentiment around uh, making things accessible. That's like one of my life goals, I think, is to make some of these data things, statistics and uh, statistical computing more accessible uh, for students and, and everyone. Um, so I hope uh, that comes across today. And thank you very much for coming. All right. And uh, I know, Ryan, if uh, do you want me to just skip over? Okay, yeah, so we're having some technical difficulties. So um, we'll just jump straight into R. So I'll kind of give a quick, I just need to share my screen and escape from here and navigate to R. So um, I'm gonna start by opening up the R window and try to move all of these controls out of the way. Um, so in our last, I'm gonna try to keep this to 15 minutes so we can go through all of the languages, but um, just a quick overview of the session before we go into loading data, um, setting directories and such. So this is sort of your RStudio window. If you open up, R, open up RStudio, this is a flavor of what you should see. Um, as you can see, this probably isn't what you're exactly seeing because it's a different color scheme and all that stuff. And it's cool that you can customize R like that. Um, but you have here the console, which is where you'll be usually doing most of your script writing. I mean, this is the console, and then this is um, sort of your text editor window. Um, you have a global environment up here. This is where R sto stores all of your objects that you create, so like variables, data frames, um, lists, any sort of data type, you can see it up here once it's loaded in. And then we have sort of this viewer window down here where you can look at files, plots, um, which we don't have any up right now, packages. Um, you have a help window and a viewer window for different types of visualizations that you could produce. Um, so, um, with my understanding, I think we shared a box folder earlier, um, that should have sort of all of our finalized scripts, um, and all the data that we're working with, um, sort of for this workshop. And so I'm going to show you kind of, um, the file structure of how that's laid out. If I can get to, uh, TNDS workshop, uh, R, uh, so we'll be in the R folder. All this stuff should have came as a zip file, zip file called rzip. If you unzip that file, you'll have a similar file structure like here. Um, you should navigate into our script. Um, and then you should click on this. Um, it may not look exactly the same, but uh, TNDS comparisons across languages.r. There are a couple other files with the same name. These are sort of just 
um, notebooks that have the code, but you can't edit the code. Um, so I'll kind of just show you guys an example. Um, so if you wanted to follow along, but you don't have R downloaded right now, we've made this sort of notebook that has all of the stuff that's going to be in our script um, and all of the output as well. Um, so that's just, if you don't have R downloaded right now, don't worry about it. You can download it later and follow it along uh, on your own time. But we're gonna start by opening this script, the R file. Um, and so that should give you this window here, um, which is the full script. And generally with um, starting off with any R script, I tend to start off by just giving the script title, um, saying who wrote it, when it was created, when it was last updated. Um, and also these two functions, which um, first off, it clears the global environment. So if you've been working in R and you have anything remaining from your global environment that you don't want in there, it's a good idea to clear that out. And dev off, that'll clear the plotting window. But we, as you can see, we don't really have anything in the plotting window right now. Um, and so setting a working directory, this is kind of a sticking point for um, a lot of workshops in R. Um, the easiest way uh, regardless of your operating system to get around this and sort of the point and click method of set, setting your working directory. Um, first, I should say what a, set, what a working directory is. So a working directory is where um, you're going to point R2 in your file structure to pull out any of the data files that you're going to be working with. Um, so for example, here we have um, sort of my working directory and all of the data that we're going to be working with is stored in this folder data. The easiest way to set your working directory using this set working directory function is to go into session, set working directory, choose directory. And in a second, this will open up a file browser into which you can navigate into that same folder that we had before. So TNDS workshop, um, you're gonna navigate into an R folder um, and then you're going to go into this data folder and then you're just gonna say open. Um, in your console is just gonna print out this set working directory function. What you can do is you can just copy this and paste it into your script. And now every time you run this file, um, you run this set working directory function, R is going to know that all of the files that you're going to pull, all the data files are going to be in this working directory. Um, and so another thing that you could look at that's very helpful is you can look at this files viewer, you can go to more, and then you can say, go to working directory. I'm already in the working directory, so I don't need to do that. And you can see all of the data that I have um, that we're going to need for this workshop. Um, I'm gonna check the chat. If there are any questions, um, feel free to leave them in the chat and I will check them periodically. Um, another way to navigate through the script is you can look down here. It's sort of a table of contents so you can see um, what parts of each script um, you can go to for different topics. Um, these four lines of code, they're a little bit complex, but it's sort of a foolproof way. Um, so if you don't have um, our packages installed or certain packages, this will check that you have these packages. And if you don't have them, it'll install them for you. Um, if you already had these packages installed, um, for R to read in a package and to use the functions in that package, you use, the, um, you use the function called library, and then you just type in the name of the package. So I'm just going to run through these lines of code, and this will sort of set up our script so that we can um, read in our data and do a little bit of data analysis if we need to. Um, and so just sort of a little bit of a short explanation on packages. Packages are sort of um, collection of functions and useful code um, that since R is open source, really anyone can make, um, and they publish online in a repository um, thing called CRAN. Um, and so R has this sort of uh, API or a connection, so it can literally just take the packages and import the functions into your R Studio uh, working environment, and then you can use them. Um, so, as we can see, we have this workshop data, our data, and we have this workshop data CSV, two different files. They contain the same data. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to read in first uh, just the R data file. And so the function that you use for that is load. And the thing that you have to put inside the function is just, since we have the working directory, you just have to specify the name of the file in quotes. So workshop data underscore, workshop underscore data dot R data. And if we run that, 
Casey, do uh, you have a question. Sorry to interrupt, but how are you running the code? Is there a button or? Oh, a... yes, yes. Sorry, it's something we take for granted uh, all the time. There are a couple ways you can run code. One thing you can do is you can highlight it and you can press this run button up here. Um, another thing is you can, whatever line you're on, if you just press control enter, or if you're on a, I'm on a Windows, so my button is control. If you're on a Mac, you can probably press command enter and that'll run the line of code that you're currently on. Um, so yeah, command enter is pretty much what I use all the time. Um, but if you just wanna highlight a section of code and run it that way, you can just use this run button up top. Um, oh, the R markdown file. Oh yeah, I forgot to do that at the beginning. Um, so there's actually, I have published the markdown file online. Um, and so I should be able to put this right in the chat uh, so that everyone can take a look at that. And that way, um, that's the wrong, it didn't copy. Did it copy? Oh, okay, here we go, the pubs file. So R also has this thing where you can publish uh, scripts online for free. Um, and so I did that ahead of time. So this is the correct script, uh, send to everyone. Um, and if you click on that link, you should be able to see a markdown file that's online on R pubs and you should be able to follow along that way if you don't have R downloaded. So, um, okay, um, so back to reading in um, our data. I'm just going to rerun everything. Um, and so we have this load function. All we have to do is specify in quotes workshop underscore data dot r data that corresponds to this file right here. And then that loads in workshop data. The cool thing about an r data file as opposed to a CSV is that an r data file saves the name of the data frame as you saved it in your last r working session. So in, our, in my last sec session, the data frame was named workshop data. And so in load, all you have to do is say load and it'll load it in as your previous name. Um, and so this is a data frame in R. Um, as we saw in sort of our, our last hour is that there's, um, it sort of has this Excel structure where um, every observation is a row, every column is a different variable that you can look at. Um, and so what you can think of a data frame as is just a, it's a, like an Excel file just in R. Um, and that's one of the great things about R is that it's very easy to work with data. Um, that's one of the strongest advantages that R has right now. Um, so another way to read in, say you have a CSV function, a CSV file, you can use this function read.csv and that'll do the same thing. The problem is if you wanted to store the CSV file, if you wanted to read in the file and store it in R, you'd have to assign it using this arrow operator and then you could assign it to something like data, data frame. And so that'll assign it to C data frame. It's in data is workshop data. It's just we're reading it in as a CSV. And so what this is, is our assignment operator and it's saying take workshop data and store it in this variable data frame. Uh, I know that's a lot, so I'm going to check if there are any uh, questions. And if not, I'm just going to go through some very, very easy to use um, functions so that you can sort of get uh, an idea of what your data looks like. And then I think that'll be it for the R demo today. When you try to import, import the file, uh, it says error. Um, so that's, the problem is that it's, um, for now it's a very general statement. Once I'm done with my session, I could probably if you want to give me more detail, you can message me after I'm done my session and I can see um, maybe what's going on. Um, so I'll try to attend to that. Um, if there aren't any other questions right now, um, I'll sort of just go through these uh, really useful functions for just like viewing your data and sort of getting a feel for what's in your data frame. Um, the first one, this names function, all it does is it print, prints out your column name. So if you don't want to look in your say in the, the viewer window to see what all the column names are. You can just say um, names DF. I didn't run this line. All right, there we have DF. Names DF, we have all these names, study ID, study arm, age days, age month, so on and so forth. Now you can see what are all of our variables that we have in our data frame. N row, it just prints out the number of rows you have in your data frame. And call, it says the number of columns that you have in your data frame. And STR stands for structure. 
and it tells you the structure of your data frame. So it gives you details on, for example, um, what type of variable, say this one, what type of variable or what type of data you have in the variable HFIS score. It says it's numeric, you have one through 2,653 values, um, and it has some other data as well. A lot of these data have labels, um, but another function that you could use that might actually be more helpful um, for beginners who don't want to look through all of that sort of um, technical stuff, you could just say summary CF. And so what this does is it prints out a simple summary of min, minimum, first quartile, um, median, mean, third quartile, max, and the number of missing values in your data set. And so if you have a lot of numeric data, this is just a very, uh, very easy way to see, um, okay, what sort of the range of my values, what is the mean and median and sort of getting a, an initial idea of the distribution of your data. Some other um, really helpful functions is you could say, look at this unique function. And so all it does is it prints out the unique values. Oh, um, one thing I need to specify first. Um, so we have a data frame and we have a bunch of different variables. And the easiest way to access these variables is um, with ours sort of um, dollar sign, the dollar sign operator, which what it does is it pulls a, a column out of a list um, or it pulls a column out of a data frame. And so what we can see is we can type out df dollar sign. Another cool thing that RStudio has is autocomplete. So it knows that you're trying to pull a variable out of your data frame. And so what you can do is you can scroll through all of the variables that you have. You don't even have to do any typing. Um, so it's a little bit of a cheat code in that way. Um, but let's say we wanted to look at uh, all the values of gender. Now that only returns all of the values in your column of gender. So we can then apply that using this unique function. And we can say, OK, what are all of the unique values of gender? And if we run this, again, using control enter, we can say, um, OK, there's negative 99, 0, and 1. And that corresponds to not documented female and male. So now you have a better idea of like what are the, the values that you have in your data frame. Um, and distinct is a little bit more general. It tells you the number of unique values you have, the number of unique values you have in a certain column. So we have 690 different um, ages in days. Um, complete cases is telling you um, it assigns essentially a true or false to every row saying, does this entire row have at least some data value in each, uh, in each column? And if it has like say an NA, which in R is a missing value, it says, okay, that's false. It's not a complete case. And so this sum complete cases just sums up, all right, how many rows do we have that has complete data? Um, this is a similar version of sum complete cases. It's just looking at a specific column. So if we're looking to see how much missing data is in age days, um, we're just going to look at the sum of missing values. Um, I think right now, uh, I'm almost at the end. Um, this stuff is a little bit more complicated. So um, if you want to look at that at your own time, just a little tip. If you want to look at help for documentation, um, just type question mark before a function and R will pull up a um, help file that you can actually read through to get to know how a function works. Um, I'm at the end of my 15 minutes, so I don't want to go too far over. Um, so I think Emily, are we? Are you presenting next, or is it uh, Kyle? Kyle will be presenting next. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, um, and I'll try to find that comment for uh, whoever was having issues with uh, errors in reading and data. But yeah, I'll stop sharing now. Hi everyone. Uh, if I have seen you before, great to see you. If not, uh, welcome. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. And so first I want to show if you haven't been able to access the information yet, you can go to the home website, click on program, dive down into the program. You can select this uh, session here and you can download those files. Uh, Ryan and Emily uh, both put that in the chat for you, but you can also download files this way. You can to explore other sessions as well and download all the associated files uh, through them. So I just want to make sure that's clear to you. Just by clicking on these, you can download those files. Once you have done that, um, you can actually access these data files. So inside of that uh, folder, when you unzip it, will be some of these files for Stata. And so I have um, put them here. There's a few files that we have available. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start Stata over again, and just as if we were just starting up. So we're going to talk through Stata 
and how to do a similar approach as to what you just saw in R within Stata. I'm going to open Stata, and if you haven't seen Stata before, on the left-hand side, we have a history panel, which shows the history of our commands. On the bottom, we have a command window, which allows us to type code and get a response from Stata. And on the far right-hand side, we have variables, and these let us uh, work with our variables. And at the bottom, we have properties, information about our variables. So you can kind of see that this is giving us this interface with the center being our results, right? The, the things we want to see, the statistics, right? Um, so what I'm going to do to start is I'm actually going to click on this little button right here. Uh, this is the do file editor. If you're into keyboard shortcuts, you can also, I forget what the keyboard shortcut for do, I used to know it but I don't now. So, <laughs> so you can just click on this tiny icon. It's a sheet of paper with a pencil. So if you can find the thing that says a sheet of paper with a pencil, this will open the do file editor. The reason why this matters is because we're gonna work with the do file. One of the cool tips that you can do once you've done this is you can drag this dot do file. This file is a script. What a script is, is a things to do list for the computer. It contains the code we're going to run today. So I'm going to drag this do file from my file directory where I downloaded it from the website and I'm going to drop it here. If I'm moving a little fast for you, don't worry. This is being recorded. You'll have access to the, these materials after the, the workshop and you can also go through this on your own. So feel free to just absorb and go through it um, once, you, once you can access or download those materials. So here we have our script. And I do want to note that this was made by a, a variety of instructors spearheaded by Ryan Simpson. He is excellent. I'm just, uh, I'm presenting this for him, uh, but this is, this is uh, his thing and he's great to work with. So I just want to highlight that. So um, this is a do file. Like we said before, it is a script. I'm going to go to view and zoom and I'm just going to zoom in. And the reason why is because my eyes are bad. <laughs> and also so you can see a little bit easier. I'm also going to do a little window management. Because I'm in Windows, I'm just going to bring this over here until it goes like this. And then I'm going to bring this one. Actually, I'm not going to do that. It looks kind of weird. I regret doing that now. I'm just going to bring it large so we can see it. All right. So now we're in Stata. And we are going to run commands in Stata. We'll compare uh, and contrast with R a little bit as we go through. So first, we're setting up our library and our working directory. Our working directory is where Stata will search for files. So first, we're going to start here on line 26. The first thing we're going to do is our first command, which is clear. I'm going to highlight line 26, and I'm going to click on this little play button up here, which is execute selection, also known as do. So I'm telling Stata when I click on this play button right at the top here to do this um, result. And you can see it says clear, that it does the result. All that this does is clear any pre-existing data I might have in Stata uh, to prepare us for this workshop. It's the same exact thing as if I typed command clear in the command window. Um, I'm just doing it in a script. So this is the same thing you saw with R. The reason why we use these scripts is because they're reproducible. If we're trying to do a paper or a project for our job, we want to make sure that it's reproducible, that in the future we can automatically rerun it without having to type. Um, so rather than use the command window as I did here, we want to use the do file. And so I've run our first command. We got this data cleared. We are ready to go. The first thing we have to do is establish a working directory. We want to use the command cd, which stands for change directory. Um, this is going to change where Stata is looking for your, your graphics, uh, the data you're loading in, anything it wants to export. And so if we want to do this, we can, we can we need to understand where our file is. And this is a larger question sort of for general computing knowledge. But I'm going to go into my Windows um, computer here. I'm going to find my do file, right click on it. I'm going to then go to get properties and get info uh, general. And I can see the location is C users, uh, my username and desktop. You could also hold down shift, click on it 
and uh, go to copy as path on Windows. So are there any questions on that? I'll just bring up the chat in case there are any questions. So now that we have the path on Windows, we want to then place this path on this location here, right here inside of these quotes. You want to make sure there's only one set of quotes here. So I'm going to delete this other set of quotes. And sometimes it will delete both of those. You just want to make sure that there's just one set of quotes. I'll make this a little larger so we can see it a little bit better. And so you can see that I've taken this path by holding down shift and I've pasted it in here. If you're on a Mac, I'll just show you really quickly. And you want to find this location. I'm going to go to my downloads where this is. I'm going to go to Stata. I'm going to find my do file here. In this case, on my Mac, I'm going to right click first and then hold down the Option key. I'm going to right click first, hold down the Option key, and then I can go to uh, Copy File Name as Path Name. So copy TNDS 2021 as Path Name, and that will give me the whole path, just like the Shift approach did. All right, that's the Option key on a Mac. All right, so back in Windows land, we are going to run this command. And if I highlight line 35 and run this, you'll see we have, well, in this case, I can't change the directory to this. I need to delete the do part because I don't want that file. I just want the folder location. I don't need the do file. And I can run it like so. And once I deleted that do part, I can see, ah, it's now changed to C users, my username, desktop, and Stata. All right. So um, the first thing we'll want to do is uh, make sure to check that our log is closed. And this will also produce our first error. So if we highlight and run line 45, like so. Oh, oh, it's kicked me out of there. Let me just log back in really quickly. Sorry about that. Um, I can actually open up Stata here. Why not? Uh, while I log in. So uh, here we go. We are here in Stata. I'm uh, just going to log back in there. Not sure why it decided to kick me out so suddenly. But while I log in, I'll just um, I'll just log in right now. It shouldn't take too long. Sorry about that. It should take about 30 seconds. All right. Uh, in case you're wondering, this is what Mac OS uh, Stata looks like. It is a little bit different in structure, but very much the same in function. It looks slightly different, um, but it is the same program and has a lot of the same features. We're back. I don't know why I decided to do that, but we are back in here. So we just changed directory into desktop. We uh, ran log closed, and here it says no log file open, our first error. Um, so that's because no log file has been created yet. We need to use log using um, file. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a log called working script. We highlight and run line 50. And here it gives us some information it's saying it's unnamed. It's a log at this location. It's an SMCL log, and it's opened at this time. So once you're done running your commands of interest, you'd run your whole analysis for your thesis or your whole analysis for uh, maybe the private sector or a grant, um, you can log close. It will close the log and, and be done with it. I like to have a log for each one of my sessions of running my script uh, so I can have a log and the date. And I can know that on Friday night when I was working really late on this project, this is my log, right? Um, if you wanted to append, let's say you come back on Saturday, you're working again, you want to append to that same log, you can use the function log using this same script that's in our working directory, right? But remember that it's saving out to C users, my username, desktop, that same working directory we set before. But I want to append rather than replace. Instead of replacing the log file, I want to append to it. And so we use the comma append function. In Stata, a lot of our options will be performed using a comma after the function we're calling. So in this case, this is telling Stata, hey, I would like you to log. I want you to call it working script. And then I want you to append to the previous working script. It's another option that we can provide. The other thing to notice about where to go when lost and how to gain help. 
the help command allows us to get help of when we're troubleshooting um, Stata. So if I want to learn about import, which I certainly do, it's an important thing to know about, I can click help import and we can, we can look at the uh, overview for how to import data into Stata. We can scroll down and learn about some examples. Stata is actually really good with readable help files. I think it's an excellent um, place to start as well. So now we're down into reading in data. I'm sure you want to work with data. We can work with uh, sample data from within Stata. The classic NHANES data set is available as a uh, sample data set um, in NHANES 2D. If we run line 78, that's line 78 as an example, um, we can link to this example data set here. It downloads it and it makes it available to us right here. We can see we have strata, PSU, region. For those of you who have worked with NHANES, you know what all those mean. Uh, and you, if you don't, it's totally fine. We can we can talk through what these are and, and how they're important. So. Uh, if you're interested in this, you might also want to import an Excel file or, or some sort of file. To do this, we have to do it a little bit differently than the use approach. Use was because this NHANES data is online, right? This is a link, HTTP statapress.com. It is the Stata data set that we want to work with. If we want to import data, we must tell Stata a few things. We must tell it the name of the file, the worksheets, if it's an Excel file, and maybe the row of data that we want to import, the column numbers that we want to import, the variable names, um, and whether they're in the first row of the data set, right? Because this data could look different. Stata doesn't necessarily know how your data is going to look. So we have to be very intentional about how we want to do this. So if we want to, we can highlight and run line 88, import Excel using workshop data, sheet workshop data, cell range, the cell range, first row clear. And if I run this, it will load in that workshop data file from my working directory that I downloaded, which I can see if I go right here, I have that workshop data Excel file. And we've loaded that in. We can tell it has 14 variables and 2,653 observations. If you want to import a CSV file, which is a type of comma separated value text file, we can do that as well. We can import delimited instead of Excel. So we want to tell Stata, import the delimited file using the file workshop data and a, this row range and this call range and the numeric columns. The reason why we have to pass all these column information, right, is because since it's comma separated, we have to be intentional about telling R um, what rows and what columns to include. Um, and it's better practice to do that. So we can do that. Highlight and run line 94, and make sure to highlight and run the whole line. If you were to only highlight this first part, it would only run half of the code. You want to make sure to highlight this whole section here from import to clear, um, and that will import the, the values. So let's say, well, we've done a lot of work and we want to save it out. We can use the save function to do this. We can save as some value or some, uh, some file name. We can say save output data replace um, line 100. We can highlight and run this, and it will save out a DTA file. That's a Stata data set. Cool tip, if you're really into R, you can import a DTA file into R just as well. So if you loved the content you saw before me, you can also um, work with that as well. So I am at my 15 minutes. Um, this is how to output data. You can also describe, view, and edit data uh, as you move forward. Um, this is something you can, you can look into as well, and we'll provide this code to you. There's lots of material on how to start generating label variables, dropping variables, um, and, and moving forward with Stata here. Um, I hope this was helpful, and, and thank you all for your attention. Oh, and I should also introduce uh, Emily, who is coming up next. I, I gotta gotta make sure to do that. Um, so please, please go ahead whenever you're ready, Emily. All right, thank you so much, Kyle and Casey. You guys have been doing awesome. So I'm the ringer. Um, be closing us out tonight. And let me see, make sure you guys can see my screen okay. I'm looking for, all right, got a couple of thumbs up. Let me just move my Zoom, right? Get organized. So, um, 
for those that don't have SAS or um, their institution or organization doesn't have SAS because this is a very expensive program, um, within the resources and shared files that we provided, there's actually just a Word document of all the code. So you can reference this if you have SAS access at work and you wanna bring it there you know, to, to explore more, but there is a Word document um, available to you. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, but when you open SAS, this is what it looks like, um, and you have five panes um, or windows. So you have an explorer, results, editor, log, and output, um, just to give you some, some orientation here. And I'm actually going to pull open one of um, my scripts, so the basic code, because it'll just provide more context as we walk through and, and give that um, more thorough um, orientation. So you guys can see this. Okay, I zoomed in a little bit because I have glasses and yeah, <laughs> I feel you, Kyle. All right, so we have these five windows and really for the, for the um, most of the time you're coding, you're gonna be working in an editor window such, like, such as this. Um, but when you are pulling in data, saving data, whether it's temporary or permanently, which we'll talk about, that is going to be over in your Explorer pane. And then when you run procedure or proc steps, which we're going to talk about, you'll be able to review your results in this pane as well. Okay, so just a little bit of orientation. Um, and similar to Stata, you can see all of um, this code is green right now. It's, it's commented out, and I'll talk about the other co um, color codes in case this is the first time you've seen SAS. Um, but SAS is a sequence of statements that are executed in order. So that's just how it, it it's like reading its own book. This is how um, it operates. Each statement needs to end in a semicolon. And one thing I love about SAS is that it's not case sensitive. Unlike R, I've tried to run many variables or objects and I get an error message because I like working in all caps, but uh, R is sensitive to that. SAS, that's not the case. So uh, for me, a plus here. Um, and then you'll see different uh, color codes again. Let me see if I can make this just a little wider. Um, keywords like data, class, model, those are gonna be highlighted in blue. Um, quotations or when we are, um, yeah, quotation string variables, they'll be in this like purple, red, magenta color. When you've identified a variable name or your data set name, you'll see black syntax formats, which we'll talk about. They're going to be like this teal color. And then comments, well, well, you know, displayed here are in green. So some common language here when we we're talking about SAS data sets, variables are your columns and observations are your rows. And then there's two types of data within SAS, numeric and character uh, data types. And missing values are represented as a period if it's numeric and a blank if it's character. So just to, again, give you some context or framework between languages and how that's read and displayed in SAS. When it comes to naming your data set or variable naming, um, just some rules here, you know, can't be more than 32 characters. Um, it can start with a letter or an underscore and it can contain numbers as well, but no special characters. And again, my favorite, it's not case sensitive. And you'll see a lot of comment blocks. And when we get into running the script, um, more so tomorrow, you'll see I've annotated a lot of like um, prompts just to remind us like review our log, things like that. So you'll see a lot of comments here. Um, but first thing we're going to do, like in Stata and in R, is that we want to establish what's equivalent to a working directory. Um, in SAS, that's called a library or a lib name. And this is where you're telling SAS you want to permanently either pull um, story uh, data sets you've created or physically like where you want SAS to pull in data from. Um, so a lib name statement uh, can go anywhere in your program, but it's typically at the beginning. So upfront, where do you want SAS to be pulling data from or saving data to? Just identify that right at the beginning of your code. And the syntax is going to be here. So we have lib name as sort of that command statement, like lib name. And then you can name your library whatever, as long as it's 32 characters or less. You could start with an underscore, you know, those um, sort of uh, rules that we established earlier. Um, you can provide an engine name. So this is just if you're working in an older version of SAS, you would want to identify that, um, or I shouldn't say older, but just a different engine of SAS between what you've saved your data set in and to what you're operating in. You would identify that um, here. And then similar, um, again, across languages is you identify where your, your uh, data set is or that path name. So as an example, 
I have lib name and I like to keep it short and sweet in one. And where is my data stored? Um, again, I've just sort of commented this out. This is where SAS is pulling data from. And then I can also create an out library. So where do I want SAS to save that data? If I run this, so I can highlight this and then it's nice. I got a little running man up here. I click submit. Anytime you run code in SAS, you always want to check your log. So this is almost like your console in R, that bottom frame, where it'll tell you if it ran successfully without errors and try to guide you if there are errors to, to correct your code. Um, or that positive reinforcement, this was a su successfully assigned. So yay, step one, we created a library in SAS. And we could do the same thing again with an out library. Um, one thing I want to note here is that each um, data set within SAS, it actually has two levels of names. So as a framework, it's called the library reference, period, and then your data set name. So the library reference is your lib name. So in this case, it's in one. That's what I assigned it. And then my data set name refers to whatever I've, I've called or saved my data set, set as. So as an example, so we're right here, as an example, lib name, so I'm telling SAS now I want to assign a library called in one, and I would just put whatever that path name is. So I've established my library. Now I want to create a SAS data set, and I use what's called the data step. So data, and I'm saying in one dot temp. SAS reads this as I'm going to uh, make a permanent uh, data set called temporary or a temp. And within that, I'm setting a temporary file called test. And so this is like a very important thing within SAS. And I, I know I struggled with it for some time trying to understand what a permanent and a temporary library is. So here, and we'll go through it, I think a little bit more tomorrow, but again, really what's important is if this um, lib name, so your, whatever you've assigned your library name, period data set is in front of it, then you're going to be making a permanent data set. If it's not there, scroll down. If it's not there, what SAS does is it assumes it's a work or temporary data set. And that data set is only available while you're in that SAS session. So you close out and you do not save that work or temporary data set. It's no longer available. So there's a real benefit to creating permanent uh, data sets within SAS. And one thing I didn't highlight, I should have. So this in dot one library, if you know you've established like a permanent library, if you go over to your Explorer and we click on libraries and we see in dash one or in one is created here. If I scroll down, there's actually that work library. So as I save um, SAS data sets, whether it's permanent or temporary, I can go into either of these libraries and one just confirm that I've saved them, but then which one did I save it? How did I save it? And is that the right thing for what I'm trying to achieve? So any questions about that? Because I, I feel that that definitely took me a while to grasp and sometimes I have to remind myself um, that there are two separate libraries, but this will be really important when we start talking about formats um, or exporting and saving your SAS data set. And then if you're sharing that information, you, um, within like a research or work group, you want to make sure you're using a permanent, um, a permanent data set or permanent library. Okay. So in SAS world, again, if you're working um, with a temporary library or that, that work library, you can either write just data temp set, you know, you're identifying what you want um, SAS to read into that new data set. So in this case, it's set. Um, and you'd run it, but it's also equal to if you were to type work.temp. So you're just identifying that lib name and where SAS is going to be saving that file. Within SAS, there are two types of steps. So you have data steps in proc or procedure steps. Data steps begin with the command data, as you've seen in some of these commented out um, or, uh, commands. Um, in an, its intention is um, to create a data set, purely to create a data set, and it ends with run or another statement or, or new data that, um, or proc indication here, okay? So data steps create data sets. Procedure or proc steps begin with proc, and then you're telling SAS to perform some sort of analysis or function, the result being some sort of output, 
right? Um, and similar to the data steps, this could um, end with run semicolon or also quit. So some uh, procedure steps in SAS will continue running in the background, especially if it's a large data set that you might have to tell the um, program to quit, to stop um, in, instead of running in the background. So you'll see that in some cases. Oh, Emily, uh, we do have one question. Um, if you unintentionally say something is a temporary library, can you go back and save it permanently after the fact? Absolutely, yes, and thank goodness, right? Absolutely, um, you can. And so I think tomorrow we'll have a few more um, demonstrations of that, um, and maybe even today if I have time. So um, I will definitely try to demonstrate that, but you can, you would, you would, let's just go through it. So say it's this, I've saved this data set here, work.temp. I've set in a data set called test and I've run it. And I do want to save that as a permanent um, file. All I would do then instead is I can, I can rerun the code as in one and rerun it. So I would highlight this all again and I would run it and it would show up then in my permanent library. Okay, so absolutely. Great question. And I think that's a, a, like a wonderful thing I'm learning about code is like you can always go back and um, redo or like revise. Even today I pulled open this code, I found an error I needed to revise. So um, it's not the end all be all if you save to one or the other, you can absolutely change your, your library. Um, and again, that permanent or temporary library. Um, pulling it all together. So here is just this section here. Um, again, lib name in one, I would identify where that path uh, is coming or where I want to save my data sets um, or pull them from, excuse me. Uh, here I have data temp and I'm gonna set in a permanent uh, data set into a temporary one. So if, to make this clearer too, now I'm setting a permanent data set. So that in dot one into a temporary one, but you don't necessarily need that work dot temp. And then if I were to use a procedure or proc steps, uh, which we'll definitely use shortly, um, proc contents is a nice way to see uh, just a nice overview of what your, your data looks like, including the variable names or those column names, how many observations you have, um, formats, et cetera. So we will definitely look at that. But this is one example of a procedure or proc step. I have some additional information um, commented out here about how uh, SAS reads data but then goes through these two phases i'm not going to go into that um that's more for your for your your knowledge if you want um in your reference um all right and then just opening and saving sas data sets so i feel like we've talked quite a bit about opening a, a sas data set and pulling that in um, but if again i wanted to save that data set very similar uh structure here i'm just saying data in one so my permanent library and it this is just me saying that's what I want to name my data set to. Okay, but this would create a permanent data set from a temporary one into my out library. Um, so actually, really, I should say, if I had a distinct out library, it could be out one. Okay, so pulling these concepts together in the TNDS, so the Nutrition Data Symposium Workshop SAS code, I'm actually just going to um, change my lib name to in it's very minor, but I didn't want to go through and put ones in front of everything again. So here is an example of where I just created a new library. Um, I don't, maybe I'm lazy, but you know, just making it work. Uh, and so uh, right now in my Explorer pane, I'm still in my permanent library in one. I'm going to use this little area to go up one level. And now you can see I actually have a new library here. And noth nothing should be saved in it, but we'll get there. At this point, again, I like to have my library set up front at the beginning of my code. If you're pulling in a SAS data set that has formats saved or associated with it, this is a great time too to use options format search. You're going to search within that library to make sure you're pulling in um, those formats. So when you read a SAS data set, it goes hand in hand with the format of, of your data set along with, with the code itself or with the data itself. We'll talk more about this as well, but I just want to make sure um, that that's up front too, that you have different options that you can set um, within your library up front as well. And always gonna be prompted, make sure you're reviewing your log or your explorer in library anytime you run your code to make sure that it was successful. All right. 
Oops. How about this? Here we go. Too many windows. Okay. So for the workshop, we're going to be using um, an Excel file and uh, to pull that Excel file in, or it could be a CSV file, a text file, you're going to use a procedure or proc uh, step called proc import. And then I'm telling SAS to, with this out um, statement here, that I want to name my SAS data set workshop one. When I import this file, where does SAS need to look for that file? So in this case, I have the path name for the specific data set. Okay. And then I also need to tell SAS what kind of database management system this is. So in this case, it's an XLS file, but again, it could be CSV, it could be a text um, file, but you would annotate that here. And then you're saying replace. So if there was an existing SAS file, this would overwrite that. Um, you're also telling SAS to get names. So once it pulls in, um, in this case, an Excel file, we typically have our column or variable names at the top. We want SAS to use those same uh, names. So we're telling SAS, yes, get those names and start reading our data then at row two. So if your column or variable names took up three, four, five rows, well, then you can tell SAS, you know, change this instead to six or five. You can be specific there, but this is where SAS is gonna start reading data. All right, and if I run this, I'm going to check my log. So we can see that the import was successful, how many observations, how many variables, that's just a nice um, check. Uh, checks and balance, which I'm a big fan of. And again, it would be a part of your uh, permanent library or your, this is your work library actually. So if I go to that, now you can see workshop one is in my work library. Okay. One thing that just took me a while that I'm hoping I can save you guys time with is that if you're importing a SAS file, it's actually a lot less work. Um, you can just say set in, you know, if it's from your, your library that you uh, want SAS to pull from, and then whatever that name of the SAS data uh, set is. Um, SAS files are typically the SAS 7 BDAT files. You don't even need to add that. Um, it's actually very quick and easy, but it took me a long time to figure out uh, as a newer coder. So just wanted to make sure you guys had those tools as well. But we are just about, you know, we have about seven minutes left. And before we start describing and viewing our data, um, you know, I'd rather we pause for questions and save that for tomorrow. Um, and you have tonight to just get familiar with the permanent temporary uh, libraries and importing the Excel file at least. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We loved having you guys. We hope this is helpful um, comparing across uh, various coding softwares. And then tomorrow is when we're going to get into describing our data, um, summary statistics, running different kinds of, of analyses. So I think that's maybe more of the meat and potatoes that you guys are looking forward to uh, as well. Uh, so we, we uh, appreciate you guys being here again.